when it came to turntables, um, I think I, I looked at it in, in the same light as my my limit is only limited to my dedication mm. as, as far as what I can achieve with it. Um, and that's not being cocky. That's just knowing that hard work pays yeah. and dedication pays and and that's uh, patience. That shit, see? Yeah, yeah man. It's killer, killer, oh, 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 Killer Keller official .com. <laughs> You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Beatbox created. Killer Keller. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller podcast. Second time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, not in central London. We are on location, power on now. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Hope you're having a good morning. Big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk, holding on the fort. Big shout out to people with the Keller Vision app free download for your street culture needs. Android, Apple, you know what it is. Get involved. We are on location, a little bit outside of Blackpool, into the headquarters of one of the pioneering turntablists of the UK and the world. Not just the Battle Supremo, not just the Battle Tool creator, but part of a, a bigger scene, a, 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 a cottage industry scene of the mods of the uh, Porter Table industry, which is coming and burgeoning and creating a new generation of DJ turntablists in the wake. The mighty DJ Woody inside the place. Oh, How are you, my brother? I'm very well, very well, man. Thank you so much for having us here. If you aren't, uh, if you aren't uh, or list, uh, watching and you're listening, we're behind us here is a peripheral of different uh, records and clay. I mean, we are in the HQ hub of the DJ Woody. This is this, right in the lab. <laughs> this is your life. This is what this is what it's all about. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. It's... And and you're outside of Blackpool. This is this is. Yeah, the... we're on uh, Costadale, Lancashire, here <laughs> on a nice sunny day. I can't believe I'm here. I mean, I see so much of it online. You know, the the whole social media. You feel like you're ever present, but to, to actually be here uh, in this current state of affairs in the pit. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's nice to have you, man. How long did it take to accumulate? How long you know to create such an environment to create from? Uh, what the records wise, yeah. or just? Wow. I mean, dude. I mean, again, if you're not if you're not watching and you're listening, there is a lot going on here. You have got turntables on one side, speakers, products. Skateboards, you got the, you know. How long did it take to amass this? Uh, I'm a bit of a hoarder, but I mean, I've I've been, yeah, I've been uh, buying records since I was a kid. Like you know, yeah. sort of. Uh, I think yeah, I used I used to buy everything on cassette, and then I remember there was a certain Run DMC album that came out that I could only get on vinyl, and I wanted it on cassette, but I got it on vinyl, and uh, from that point onwards, everything was vinyl. Uh, so yeah, and yeah, seven inch records were the cheapest from Woolies back in the day as well, man. So all tight the wool screw. If you're not from the UK, you won't have a thing what we're talking about there. Woolies was the spot, man. Yeah, man, you get 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 all the singles <laughs> for a couple of quid. So yeah, all my sort of first uh, hip hop singles were all on seven and stuff, you know. So yeah, man, just a massive massive fan and massive music fan. Mm. So yeah, yeah, forever. Yeah. We we spoke about this on the car on the way up, and um, you and me share a very similar. Uh, walk of of our youth when the the American side of well the Americanism the the, the the export of America came over to the UK in the mid nineties in such a way I mean now it's just a given but you know there was the skateboarding there was the DJing the hip hop as a whole combined with just just that <laughs> capitalist, <laughs> capitalist well, world well yeah Malcolm McLaren you know yeah. he, he brought it over as a package didn't he do you know what I mean so you have yeah. this almost you know yeah like I just remember <laughs> well I mean to be honest with you I remember not being that into music t to a certain point when I was a kid because nothing shouted at me do you know what mm. I mean like there was new wave out like mm. I wasn't into aha or Duran Duran or whatever you mm. know what I mean liked a bit of adamant and a bit of madness but then uh then boom, do you know what I mean? Like, you see Run DMC, like, people are breaking at the school disco. Like, there's graffiti on, like, down the street from me, you know, mm -hmm. people popping and what whatnot outside the cinema in Burnley, you know. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, there's this cool thing that's, like, seems all together as a package, you know what I mean? And uh, and it, it called you, didn't it? It was like, a, this is a calling thing. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what chord it, like, it just it struck a massive chord, you know. Like, I'm a little bit, 
like well, I, th- I think we were about a similar age, isn't it? Mm. But like um, I'm a li- couple of years younger than your typical first gen UK hip hop lot. Mm. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, but I've got an older brother, so it was like people in his class, like uh, you know, who could throw down a windmill or show show you how to do floats or mm. whatever, or you know, had had a big case of cassettes that you could sort of tape to tape. You know what I mean? So it was just it was just all that really. I just all, always kind of jumped on the stuff that my brother was exposed to and mm. kind of um like I say yeah the skateboarding and the hip hop just uh yeah it just spoke to me. It's funny that you everyone needs a everyone needs a conduit don't they? They need a person that will almost like an enabler. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, massively, massively. Like I think yeah, I mean yeah, my me and my brother are actually pretty dissimilar but like growing up you know we to a large extent latched onto the same stuff do you know Mm -hmm. what i mean um i think with particularly with the hip-hop stuff i kind of at uh, at some point i realized that i wanted to actually do this thing do you know what i mean Mm -hmm. rather than just being a fan of run dmc Mm -hmm. and eric being rakim and Mm -hmm. you know everything like you know yeah i wanted to write a rap i wanted to make a beat i wanted you know i wanted to scratch you know what i mean mm-hmm. um i wanted to do it all um so it's at a certain point you know where where if friends sort of seem to get into other stuff um i realize that um, you know yeah i want to do this thing you know yeah and make it <sighs> contribute I think that that's one thing when I think of DJ Woody, and for those of you that don't know, like we're talking levels of world champion scratch DJing here. That this guy here is, he's pioneered sounds and styles and uh, retrained people's idea of, of scratching into a musical addition to, to, to the, the, the instrumental tapestry, oh, haven't you? Thank you, dude. I mean, that's, yeah, the, the, the musician musician side of it um has kind of really always been important um to me probably f- from the basis of hearing you know running dmc talk about jam master j mm. uh, in the context of him being their band do you know what i mean mm. um and then obviously you've, you've you know when rocksteady djs came out do you know what i mean mm. there, there were three of three of them you know wrecking shop as a band you know mm. one's doing the drums and and um you know so with the guys I came up with, that that was our our tact. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like with, there was there was a few of us, and you know that's what we were trying to do. And then, sort of, yeah, like sort of mid late nineties, we we had a jam night in Manchester where the turntables were the lead instrument, and we had musicians around us, and we'd we'd freestyle for the last two two hours of the night. You know, no, and, that's uh, mad. So yeah, so you really it almost was like a whole total package just landing in just the way it's gone and just yeah. kind of um yeah like the things like was yeah the things that really spoke to me um were that that just just the for the artistry do you know what i mean like yeah. um we talk about the turntables and musical instrument you know we we've always had to battle to get that recognition you know and you know if you can contribute something that strengthens that argument do you know what i mean mm. like cuz i believe it but like you know, you know your mum and dad ain't gonna believe you until you you show them that look, you know I can I can be just as dexterous as a guitar player here, and I can flip this sound in ways you weren't expecting. Do you know what I mean? And that's kind of the magic. Do you know what I mean? Like, what, what does your mum and dad? Because th- let's get into the growing up side of this because I know you're a skateboarder as well. What did your mum and dad at the time, though, even up till now, think of the way that you have? Because you have you've represented it in a particular way and you've gone with your gut and put what you've been thinking all the time all the while into into fruition it's a thing now like know, what do they you, think what yeah. do they think um i don't know to be honest with you like <laughs> i think my dad yeah i mean the hip hop thing from you know my mum busting in my room like sort of you know mimicking run dmc lyrics on the on the, you know into <laughs> into a hairbrush and all that lot you know i think they've back in the day you know it's like typical oh it's a fad you know whatever is into and then you know it comes to sort of 10 years later when i'm actually you know sort of doing this thing and getting out there and then you know the crunch point you know yeah i'm thinking of quitting my job you know Mm. you know doing all this i'm not sure really i I don't think they really can because they kind of don't really get it like it's just kind of 
been on the periphery. Mm. Okay, that's what he does. It seems to be working. He's paying his bills. Yeah, <laughs> Do you know yeah, what I mean? Um, yeah, it's uh, it's yeah. I think it's a bit of a sort of anomaly for him. <laughs> really, they don't really. Yeah. Yeah, and I suppose as a kid, again, you know, just going back to the skating and stuff, and where you came from growing up, then. To, to to have a to lay, have a laser focus on what you wanted to do and actually channel your your pocket money or your you know your income at a young age into creating what is a, 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 a catalog of records. It's some crazy. I mean, moving forward, but you know, back in the day, I'm sure they were pretty content knowing that you were just into what you were into and you were doing it. Yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah, I, like. I was I was kind of always an art kid, so I was always into kind of creative stuff. Do you mm. know what I mean? And that that was encouraged, you know. And um, and I kind of excelled in that, you know. Um, and I think I I kind of tried to take th- through that. I think I learned that if I um, committed myself to learning something and uh, practicing it, mm. then I realised that you can kind of get to where you want with it. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And and that was kind of probably instilled from from the art. So when it came to turntables, um, I think I, I looked at it in, in the same light as my, my limit is only limited to my dedication mm. as, as far as what I can achieve with it. Um, and that's not being cocky that's just knowing that hard work pays yeah and dedication pays and and uh, that's patience. That shit, see yeah. yeah man so like so i never necessarily looked at uh, a dj and thought i couldn't get to that level i just knew that it was going to take some work yeah. you know and and from that it's using your own kind of um creativity and um and ideas and thinking and also approach like how you approach something that can um that can advance where where you go with it do you know what i mean like um not limiting yourself and sort of the ethos that you take to an art form you know um setting yourself challenges Mm. and you know sort of thinking out of the box Yeah, yeah yeah thinking for yourself and avoiding what the pack are doing and all, all those kind of ideas man just um yeah, I just I just love it to this day. <laughs> it's interesting when you say the pack because over the time now we we're, we're getting into an era of the scratch perverts were most definitely holding court. This was like the golden era of I don't know, but it was certainly there was a momentum riding on the new turntablism phenomenon, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, individuality was key. You you Going into those arenas, you just had to be unique, and you had to be holding court, didn't you? You know, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think the UK scene, sort of late nineties, like, it's one of the strongest scenes in the world. You know, like, mm. um, yeah, Q, Q and Mike and everybody came over for Fresh ninety seven, mm. like a couple, couple of years earlier. The perverts were coming up, um, creatively, like what was going on in the UK, particularly at that time, you know, after the sort of mid, mid nineties, well, it was still booming, you know, you still Mm -hmm. had craze obviously in 98, 99, you know, Petrix. And there was so much creativity (laughs) everywhere. And it was like, so to choose or to be at the level with, within, you, you know, sort of your, your sort of, um, to be a DJ at that time, to be a, a battling DJ mm. of that time coming up in that era, um, it did force you to work doubly hard, you know, because like <laughs> the, yeah, um, the creativity was off the scale. Every year people were coming with new stuff, you know, like I used to go to all, all the all the UK finals, certainly all the Manchester finals I could get to from, you know, early mid nineties, well, yeah. early early nineties on. And, um, you know, every year, you know, there'd be a new thing, you know, XL did a twiddle and that was like the first multiple finger, you know, um, fader technique I'd ever seen. And it's like, oh my God, like he's using another finger on the fader and it's doing it double time. And then Q Q comes with the crab and then I see, you know, prime cuts doing a crab and, you know, like sort of sticking the up faders up. The kind of thing. And all the Euro stuff and Vegas with like some of the up fader Mm. stuff and then plus one with the agility and speed Mm. and, you know, so, and then you're stepping in, 
you get to the UK final and you're battling these, you know what I mean? Mm. It's like my attitude was, you know, one of contributing, one mm. of trying to be fresh, coming through th- that hip-hop ethic of not biting. And not being from London as well. You're working doubly hard to to push through, cut through the noise as well, right? It, it felt, yeah. I mean, obviously the UK scene is naturally London-centric. It mm. always has been because the media's there, mm. you know, hip-hop connections there. Mm. Like, um, you know, it's the, it's the country's capital. Do you mm. know what I mean? So, so the spotlight is on London. So naturally um, those DJs within that scene... Um, that's the main focus, you know, yeah. of, the, of the rest of the UK. So um, being from from Burnley, a small town in Lancashire, 20 miles outside of Manchester, mm. um, you know, I had to work hard just to get props in Manchester. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then you're in, then you're getting out of town and all of a sudden you're with the big boys, you know, you're in a battle with, you know, first rate Mr. Thing and Prime Cuts. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like... You know, you might have half the scratch perverts in the battle. The other half are on the judging panel. Mm. So if I'm going to make any noise whatsoever, it better be tight. I better, you know, I better. <laughs> uh, yeah, like you've got, you've got to come with it. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Um, Do so, you think that's a hunger? That that is because I'm, you know, I'm I'm originally from outside of London. Mm. That hunger is the drive. Yeah. The, well, it's it's actually even though at the time it feels frustrating. Uh, because, you know, you might do a battle and you think, oh, well, you know, because he knows everybody and mm. this, that, whatever, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. You know how it is coming up. Yeah. and uh, Or even even just the reception you get from a crowd, even though you think, well, I just did something nobody's ever done before, but, uh, you yeah. know, whatever. May, I swear to God, uh, yeah. Um, I know exactly so you know how it is. is, but in retrospect, that kind of underdog element is such a driving force. Mm. And it is actually a buzz. Like, when you've cut through that mm. when you're the guy who all of a sudden dude like after, after the first time I went to UK DMC final uh, 99 did my thing outside like you know sort of uh, northerner down with his mates doing his thing trying to represent you know what I mean um, a month or so later I went to the first UK team championships walking down the street in Labrook Grove towards Subterranea or where, yeah. wherever it was DJ Pogo like, like hero. Yeah, legend. Hero. UK hip hop. You know, I'm a massive UK hip hop geek as well. But like, yeah, uh, Pogo walks past me and I seen him. And I'm like, oh, that's DJ Pogo. <laughs> he stopped to, to say what's up to me. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Some kid from Burnley who'd been buying, you know, MC Mellow records from time. Do you know, all all, all his related mm. projects. All the affiliates. And yeah. Yeah. And, and he's like, ah, Woody, innit? Props, I love your set. I was just like, dude, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, it's all you need. You could die and go to heaven now. That's... Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, like, um, once you cut through that, and these guys you've been looking at, you know, give it your back. Yeah. You're just like, oh man, and that is that was such a motivating factor. Yeah. So from that point, it's like I'm not here to make up numbers. Yeah. I'm here to win. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm here to make my mark. Come on, <laughs> you know talk I mean? that shit. <laughs> That's right, but um, but yeah, man, just hip hop. You know what yeah. I mean? Just that drive to, to to get better personally, yeah. but also to contribute to, to the culture and bring something. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, um, big big time, big time. Scenes outside of London tend to do that. They, and it is it is the underdog effect. It's the play to win. It's the uh, you, you you. That's where I feel like that's where the create creative hubs are. That's where the um the forging new ideas comes from. Whether it's graph, whether it's um, breakdancing or anything, it's like London, big shout out to my London crew, but you know us, we can sometimes get complacent because of things outside our front door. It's when you're it's when you're in the back streets, in the places where we're so out there, that's where the new ideas, that's where the next thing kind of is incubating. I, th- I think it's it's an interesting dynamic because, you you know, you're growing up in a town where nobody's into what you're into, mm. particularly if it's turntable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, when I was skating, there might have been 20 Burnley skaters, 20, yeah. 30 Burnley skaters. Um, there were no scratch DJs. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like There was every, no scenes. Every, There's no, no scenes dude, there. Like, I mean, back in the... Yeah, everybody was breaking at the school disco. There was a bunch of graffiti artists. There was a bunch of people into it, mainly people I was at the time, older than me, probably out of the circles of the headheads mm. in my town. 
But so far as like the, those dudes listening to DJ Supreme, Hijack, trying mm-hmm. to, you know, just trying to... I remember like from 88, I think it was about 88, when people, we were getting more into skating. Some of the skaters who was banging to the hip hop was kind of still into it, but not wanting to do it. Yeah. Um, I was still writing rhymes, doing my little graffiti and my things and whatever. It's still like Hip Hop Connection had started by mm-hmm. that point. There was a few years where I was like the only like hip hop dude. I, I didn't know anybody. Do you know the what I mean? The only hip hop kid in the village. Yeah, literally. You, man. Like, That's yeah, true. A couple of people liked some of the rap music, but yeah. nobody I knew wanted to do it. Because we were both called Lee, right? See, we all had yeah, those man. nicknames in schools for the kids that are outsiders. Because we were outsiders, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, we weren't ambitions weren't to go to the pub and drink and listen to you know uh new wave british indie music <laughs> and stuff so i was ice lee yeah yeah, <laughs> was yeah. Like... We, we discovered yeah i was easily before easy e <laughs> hold on <laughs> yeah man before N- nwa came out and yeah. uh yeah my little rap crew i made my best mate who was into heavy metal at the time i made him get into rap and learn run dmc lyrics and we started uh we had this little thing called the Psychic Boys, and we used to go around the schoolyard, like with like, whatever. Do you know what I mean? But, but yeah, it wasn't till my brother went to college in '91, came back from college, uh, and he's like, "There's a, there's a, there's a lad in my class exactly the same as you." I'm like, "Right, what do you mean?" And uh, he brought back this getting to know your little book thing, mm. and uh, Chris uh, was is his name, and uh, it was like biggest influence Chuck D. Uh, you know, most influential Terminator X or whatever. And uh, and my brother's like, yeah, and he's a DJ and he's got decks. And uh, he lived in this little village called Barn Oldswick just outside. Revelationary, you know. Oh, dude, I was like, th- that was after waiting, after like starting high school, I was looking for the dude with a kangol on, mm-hmm. whatever, looking looking for the, peop- the person with a public enemy badge mm-hmm. on, you know, just looking for them hip-hop heads, so, so, you know, so, somebody to bounce mm-hmm. off. And, uh, yeah, it took a couple of years, but, like, yeah, 91, hooked up with Chris and Rick, uh, rest in peace, Rick. Um, yeah, all of a sudden I've got a DJ crew, you know, like I was saving up for turntables in 91, whatever, buying my records, wanting to do it, practicing on my mates. And then come 92 when I got my first first set up. It's going you know down. I mean? It's like we've got a crew. We're like the Barn Oldswick stroke Burnley you know, want to be pickles, want to be like hijack, and it's you against you know? the world, isn't it? Because once you've defined, because then you've got then you've got rapport, then you've got conversations, and these conversations, that's what th- those are the things that s- spur you on. It's like coaching, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, uh, we, I mean, we all had our different vibe. Like Rick was like he's older generation, so he was like five, like like round one UK. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. electro. Do mm. you know like yeah could cut up super nasty on electro mm. like just fastest transformers i've ever seen mm. and stuff rick like uh, uh sorry chris just a couple of years older than me but he already had decks and he could already cut and mm. do you know what i mean and uh, we were all all about the uk brick core like you know untitled so you know like, it. yeah gunshot all them mm. blade and you know we're into aggressive fast hip-hop yeah, yeah, yeah. and we wanted to scratch like maniacs that's the shit <laughs> Does it? I've got to say though, Woody, you know, and I, I alluded to this at the start, and it, and it holds true through the times that because we we come up through the same era, same the era, same. Era. Yeah, man. Um, never have I met someone so versatile that, as a selector as well as a turntablist, can transfer those skills and make it a complete three sixty B line <laughs> towards instrumentalizing a turntable like i remember seeing you at shows with oh man uh, ranging from uh you with a a a a, a moog player or you know a Rhodes player to you using a wah-wah pedal to you using some crazy instrumentalists as part of a band russian percussion hold tight dj vadim um and i know you've done so many other projects but you're i've never met a, a more superiorly skilled oh, DJ dude. bro for real like oh. I mean it like but but lo- but lowering not lowering but um diluting your your skill set to fall in line with other people as a as a cooperative in a band and things like that do you well, know what I'm saying yeah well, thank you well firstly thank you I mean yeah <laughs> 
Yeah. Uh, but uh, facts, though, come no. on. Uh, Don't you dare comment anything else. You know he's been putting in the work. And you do put, you do put yourself in context with other acts and artistries around you that, that compliments rather than, I'm going to do like a thousand miles per hour scratch. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you really know how to. Well, work it's it. like you, you don't scratch all over a vocal chorus. You know, you've got to know your place in the band. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, so if, yeah, you're DJing for a rapper, you, you, you do what's going to work best for that show. Do you know what I mean? You've mm. got to put yourself in context. So it's like if I'm playing a club and trying to keep people dance, yeah, I'll put some stuff in it, but like I'm not going to go to town doing the crazy instrumental geeky X, Y, and Z that I might do for a, an Instagram video mm-hmm. or, or for a DJ battle. You know, it's context, you know, and it's and it's just trying to be tasteful. Um, but I, I mean, I kind of got into this. I didn't get into... DJing just to play clubs or just to just to scratch an R and a fresh. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I, I've like all of it excites me. Do you know what I mean? I mm-hmm. want to be able to put a well thought out mix together and take you on a journey. Mm-hmm. I want to be able to keep people dancing and smiling in a club. I want to be able to take the turntable to new heights as an instrument. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I, you know, there's there's so many little mini projects within this art form mm-hmm. that that are interesting and exciting and creatively little pockets of scenes which is it keeps life yeah. interesting man like i mean yeah that that's just me you know i um i like to work on different things and and all these aspects of this uh yeah this culture really excite me and interest me so mm. why not why not try and do your best with all of them do yeah. you know what i mean like, well yeah but there are so many i mean there's there's the porter scene. There's the uh, battle tools, the battle tool genre of of music making. There's there's like you say your, and again being here is fucking awesome because your your social media platform which highlights all your skill sets. This the meat and veg of your of your trade. That is most definitely a scene itself. Um, moving on from perverts, you know. We talked about this before going into Tiger Styles and um, Scully and all these uh, yeah. your contemporaries as well. You know that you you all you took that what was the almost like the the beginning of the golden era mm. and you transferred it into all these other newer pockets and and it did turn into a club thing. It, there was this burgeoning like attention want, wanting these elements to go into clubs, wasn't there? Well, I mean. At the, at the, as as you well know, like you know, at, at the time we were quite lucky in the fact that this creative sort of uh, boom in the whole whole scene mm. coincided with, thankfully, kind of a resurgence in the interest of hip hop and this kind of renaissance in mm. true school hip hop. You know, yeah, like yeah. Raucous Records and every, you know all that yeah. UK jazz fudge and you yeah. know all all this. You know the the scene came back to a a position where you know, we could go out and do tours. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, wow. I mean, th- those those Russian percussion tour schedules. I mean, wow. Mammoth. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know. Uh, so what holiday? What day off? Are you mad? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I did that in my 20s anyway. Yeah, That's yeah, all yeah, I'm yeah, saying. <laughs> Big up, Vadim. Yeah, man. You were bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's why I've got grey hairs now. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, I mean, luckily there was kind of, you know, if you did do well within the, the battle culture... There was that springboard to be able to do some touring with transfer or and get get into the clubs and stuff. Yeah, which um, which necessarily from a certain point a few years ago there wasn't necessarily that um, availability of scene. You know, like mm-hmm. the tides tide shift and um, you know sort of what your sort of eight. I mean, a lot of it's dictated by what your eighteen to early twenties mm. are into. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And we could go and do university balls and student union gigs and mm. because you know yeah like our our scene had a scene you know what i mean that's right it's seasonal isn't it i think every there's everyone has their time to shine in the sun um you mentioned actually in the car that there was a, a real poignant moment where you discuss that this the, the light switch went on from night to day as yeah, far as... No, no, it, yeah, yeah <laughs> as far as the scene's concerned. Yeah, it was kind of... When would it be? Like, early... Two, it would be like two, maybe 2004 or something, that mm. kind of it, 
when dubstep was about to take over, mm. basically. Mm. And yeah, we'd we'd all been doing our thing, you know, you could have these big lineups, you know, with the the pervert, skits, Rodney P, yourself, you know, mm. all all the all the all the guys on there. And um and then dubstep came along and washed its hands with like the hip hop scene really like <laughs> not being funny but like I, I I remember there was this one moment and I can still remember it viscerally you know like like I've got really vivid imagery of it and um I'd been working working my ass off like playing this big sort of room there was like 2000 people in there doing a, a hip hop set sort of uh, you know I I like my stuff with funk in it so it was like you know, pretty, pretty funky stuff or whatever. But people were dancing, people were smiling, you know, it was it was a vibe. Uh, but yeah, doing what I do as a scratch DJ, I was juggling this, doing that, you know, really putting the work in. And uh, there was this guy on after me called Casper and I'd sort of heard of him, whatever. Mm. And I knew I knew he was dubstep, but I'd, I'd never, at that point maybe, never DJed directly before uh, anybody playing that or certainly not in a big, big venue like that. And uh, he came on with this sort of uh, white label, um, and I'm packing, about to pack my stuff down. It was super chilled, and uh, just put the needle on the record, and like, it was, you know. But but what blew my mind wasn't necessarily that, you know, mm. <laughs> that bass. It was what what it did to the crowd, mm. and it was it was like the crowd just went vroom. changed the whole day, yeah, really. like it didn't. It was it was almost heartbreaking because it was like it, it it wasn't like you do this thing and you're presenting your skills and that used to be a thing mm. that everybody was like you're DJing everybody's crowd around the DJ mm-hmm. box in a hip hop night do you know mm-hmm. what I mean everybody's waiting for the showcase mm-hmm. you know like like that is the focus mm. that is like the thing that people are into mm. all of a sudden it felt it's like they're not interested in how many things I juggle or mm-hmm. how tight the juggles are mm. or what the scratches are doing. Um, man, it's just that tune. You know what I mean? Like that—that that was what the one thing. And um, yeah, like I think that felt like a sort of a, a change. You know, like your sort of scratches in Edinburgh and London and no fakings mm. and all, all the sort of foundations of this scene that we'd been playing and yeah. that we'd been enjoying for the last few years. Um, there seemed to be a shift. You know, the students were into a different yeah. thing. The promoters couldn't necessarily make profit out of those kind of nights anymore. So it was definitely an interesting time for us hip hop heads. Yeah, man. It switched quick. I was, yeah. I mean, I was at the time. Oh no, it was a few years later. I, I did. I was doing the band stuff straight after that. So yeah, I, I didn't need that for my buoyancy. But mm. Yeah, luckily, kind of. Yeah, the Russian percussion, and then I went to DJ for a big Spanish hip hop star called Malo Rodriguez. And we was so, so luckily I had those kind of other projects to kind of keep See, me going. See, things on. that were off the socials at the time because there wasn't really any. But um, I'd argue, like in terms of in terms of technical ability and where it disappeared in the clubs, social media definitely made up for it as a platform where you could show off your skills or, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it was interesting. I, I got on. I used to have a, a website actually. My label's called Woodwork now, and way beyond way before the label uh, had a website called woodwork.com spelt the same way as i remember it yeah yeah, that's right and that's where i put pre-youtube i put like little whatever were they dot rm files or whatever the video file Mm -hmm. was at the time and that's that was my little platform to try and get these little ideas out i was was trying to trying to put out um because my thing outside of the battling was i wanted to present ideas you know Mm -hmm. what i mean like keep um yeah just uh keep 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 the thing moving so far as yeah. turntablism you know um and technology like just going back to the casper thing and the, the the way that that impacted um you've always been ahead of the curve and there's certain things that i i bet you took away from sonically whatever the song was doing um the nature of how it was presented i'm sure there was a lot of elements there that you could probably lean towards even something from not so long ago that was like actually that kind of works it's very similar to that what was happening back then da, da, da. it's mm. doing that now in this tune and and you can do this into that but if you were doing it with turntablism you could reinterpret it in a different it, it feeds itself doesn't it yeah i mean it's sort of funny how the creative process works sometimes sometimes mm. things just kind of 
seep in there, sort of in the background, and then they come to fruition later on. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, you've got to be open, man. Like, I, even though, you know, sort of a, culturally, you know, hip hop is, you know, where it all comes from, I, I don't think you ever make any kind of interesting contribution if it's only self referential. Do you know what I mean? That's oh, obvious. he's so right. It's so true. Obviously. Obviously, you know, hip-hop comes from all these different genres of music. And yeah. that's what our culture uh, nurtures, like, you know, the sort of exploration and r- research of older musical forms. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's like graphic design, do you know what I mean? Or, or any any art form, you're sort of taking elements and yeah. sort of doing something with it. And um, so I think it's like, it's like rappers who only listen to rappers scratches who only listen to scratching do you know what i mean yeah. you if 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 you open yourself up to things beyond your culture then inevitably you're going to it's going to come out in in a way that's fresh to your culture do you know what i mean mm. hopefully fingers crossed reinterpreted twisted up fed through yeah you're right do you think there's a lot of feedback going on at the moment maybe that that there should be an outside a more outside influence i mean again like i'm talking to you you're like you you create battle tools that have crazy sounds and your mission is to not make it sound like anything but do you think from a from a more general overview of the of the music scene do you think there's a lot of feedback going on of of similar influences and plagiarism um well, yeah, that well, yeah, that's the sort of uh, the plagiarism play, word. Yeah, with no, that, that, yeah that in, in hip hop circles, that's going <laughs> to like go off on a tangent, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. But like, um, yeah, it's, so far as so far as it's it's a funny one these days because you know you'd think with the opening of you know sort of you can listen to anything anytime anywhere. You have got the internet, you got Spotify. Um, you'd think like uh, influence would be super diverse, mm. but it doesn't seem to sort of uh, happen that way. Yeah. You know, it seems to get filtered even more i mean I, I i think i think our role kind of without being that narky guy on the internet whinging about everything um it is i don't think we should be like oh this is the way it was and this is the way it should be yeah but there are certain ethics within the culture of hip-hop that actually encourage things to always be different things mm. to always be fresh it does by default creativity do you know yeah. what i mean and that is that is what you know was uh, instilled so certainly in me and i know when you from what you do what you've done with beatboxing man like yeah, yeah, yeah. coming with your own style being fresh I hate to say it but not biting do yeah. you know what i mean owning like, your own style yeah yeah because like yeah to get your levels up you're obviously you're gonna look at you know the the certain foundational skills and you're gonna um replicate your heroes and everything but from that point from that platform mm. from that sort of springboard it's for you to take it do you know what i mean yeah. and we still need to remind people of that i think i think at, sure. at this sort of age and time i think there's there is value for the longevity of the culture and the art form in mm. instilling some of these Basically, I mean, it's common sense. You know what I mean? It's just a creative ethos. You style know? is everything, man. Yeah. Style is... St- do you, we're of an age, right? And yeah. we're of an age. We, we've we gone through the the circuit. We've gone through the creative process. We've, we've forged our own style. Then the next style comes in. I feel personally it's super important to retain your own identity. You know, and there's loads of DJs out there that are... Comp- comparable to this like mix master mike always comes with his own stuff and it's almost like incubate it's, it's like time capsuled do you know what i mean yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Th- that's super important isn't it like as an age when you get to that point it's like well if you own it you, you have to own it because if no one else is going to own it for you you know yeah it's super important isn't it yeah i think um i think the advancement of skill is is um it's crazy hyperspeed these days with mm. the internet and everything mm. obviously you've got you've got Qbert did the DIY uh, DVD. Uh, Angelo's got like DJ Angelo, big up. He's got okay. like um, like really cool sort of um, t- tutorials, and you know, there's all, all all these resources to learn all your foundational skills out mm. there, and um, and that's wicked, and it brings 
uh, beginners up to speed super quick. Like I remember, you know, it probably took us like two years from listening to Cash Money on a record to figure out how to do a chirp. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like we had to figure that stuff out. Yeah. Um, which, which brings it, which I think that like difficult process brings out naturally brings out um individuality as well into your style for sure because you've had to figure stuff out and it takes forever but once you've got there you've 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 failed a million times mm. and you've you've um figured out your own way to do it so it sounds a bit different to this guy That's and, so true uh, so I, th I, th I think when if you've got you know five thousand djs learning one technique from one source online it it can it can sort of make everybody sound similar. Yeah. Um, but like I say, that's that should that shouldn't be um, that definitely shouldn't be a hindrance because at the end of the day, people are getting amazing within two or three years, mm -hmm. whereas you know it might have taken a decade before. So so once you get all that stuff, just it's experimentation and having fun with it and like you know yeah. don't look at it like get into the next level of a video game look at it uh, what it is it's music it's supposed to sound good on your ears you know what i mean it's yeah, like yeah. um yeah and I'd, yeah you, i think you can get so far with technicality to a point but um if not that it's about being remembered but if if if, if you want your mm. output to to resonate mm. to to culturally have some kind of bearing it, it um it needs to say something else that's not been said that's right you know? that's right uh that's the currency cultural currency isn't it it's like it owning and having that um, the ten thousand hours is everything yeah. like trust the process isn't it yeah and, and we've, it's like we've, skating, man. It's like I was just about to say because yeah, I was just looking at the skateboards, thinking, "Wow, I wonder how many times you fall." At least with the DJing, you're not, you know, you're not breaking nothing as you're doing it. That, <laughs> that said, man, I spent yeah, like first few years, I had bloody fingers, man. Like mm. especially when it was all transformer switches. Yeah, how many times did you like? Did you get calluses and stuff on your fingers? Couple first, tunnel first couple of years, like we we used to go. Yeah, we used to hammer it, do you know what I mean? And it was all switches. Did it all hurt? Did you, was your wrist hurting when you... Because these are layman's questions that, you know what I mean? It's like, even I don't even... I've never even asked before. That Did that shit hurt when you were... Yeah, I mean, t to be honest, even even these days, you know, I'm a dad now, I've got two kids and everything, and, um, you know, I've got a lot of responsibility, so I don't practice like I used to. So if I, if I, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, man, I need to catch up again, you know, like I need to, need to get on it again, you know, if, if I'm you know sort of uh yeah get on it for a solid couple of hours it might start hurting again but mm. I, I always remember kind of yeah where we, we used to go for practice sessions and you would get calluses and and literally you know i've been cutting until i'm bleeding mm. or even a couple of years ago i was trying some some sort of weird uh on record kind of hand stuff and it was a little bit off the wall and it was a f experimenting do you know what until I mean? until your hands bled you were trying yeah, I've, yeah, I've definitely had like some Mad. Of blood. Like, like I say, a couple of years ago, um, I was trying this weird on the record stuff, and I was trying it, trying it, getting the sound, getting the sound. Ah, oh, the sound's sounding cooler. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Then, then I look at my hand. That I totally hadn't realised that my my fingers were bleed. Like the top of the fingers was bleeding. It was a weird move, but like um, I was that absorbed in the creative process and trying to make it sound good. I'd not realised that obviously this certain part of the hand that I was using had never had any. Can't, never necessarily been utilised for scratching, so it was bonkers. raw skin, you know. Bonkers. That's <laughs> crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> it's fun, man. You know, you know you're alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you see blood. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. totally. Um, going back to, I mean, listen, woodwork is on fire. You've, oh, you've got you, all dude. these different sounds, packs, you're the beatboxing. Big shout out to Ballsy, who yeah, did the beatbox podcast, that's my guy. Um, but also, you know, the Porter, you know, the Porter scene and the the mods that are coming in with that. These are miniature, for those of you who don't know, these are miniature turntables we can take anywhere. You could be in any environment. Um, you, you're you one of the key figures that is representing the, the sale and the creative aspects to what you can do with these, um, with this scene. Do you mean? And I feel like woodwork is really like championing oh, that shit. Thank you, dude. Uh, well, I'm just trying to, like the yeah, the portable scene is amazing. I mean, uh, like just for the fact that, you know, if if you're lucky enough, a ten year old, you know, with the price barrier has gone so so uh, 
so much lower than when I was a kid. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like for 100, 120 quid, if your 10 year old really wants to learn to scratch and you can afford it, then boom, you, you're away. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like that's like at least 50% of what the most basic, basic belt drive setup would have cost mm. when I when I was that age. There was no way I could have been if if I could have could have had something to scratch on it at ten, dude, I I was creating run DMC beats to the rhyme routines on my mum and dad's MIDI hi fi at ten. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But like give me a portable turntable with a crossfader in it. Oh my God. See you later. You know, yeah. yeah. Like, so so it's amazing for that because I think DJing unfortunately has always had an economic barrier. You know, whether it's buying the records mm. or the equipment. It was not cheap. Now, it wasn't cheap es- to enter. Especially with the new era of digital stuff. It's like, what? Like mm. £2,000 for the latest DJ mixer and we're trying to tell kids to start DJing? Mm. On top of that, they're going to need two turntables and a £2,000 Mac laptop. Yeah. Pfft. Fuck that. Do you know what I mean? Like, I was working yeah, class kids. I feel you. Yeah. That's, that, that ain't going to happen. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, that was half the problem. You know, you, to know a DJ or to know someone with an NPC player, they were like, where did you come from? What planet were yeah, you from? Like, mad. Yeah, man. Like, I, I was saving, I remember I got £1.50 pocket money for, not pocket money, uh, school, school meal money at mm. school. And I figured out how I could feed myself for the 50p and save the quid. Mm-hmm. So at the end of five days at school, I'd have a fiver that I could buy a 12 with at the end yeah, of the week. Yeah, and yeah. that's not like, you know, like, yeah, yeah. You know, like uh, Trust me, this what is, was this me. Is, this but is like, weekly. This is, everything we're seeing behind here in the visual here, all the records, you know, these are this is top to tail, the, the blood, sweat and no no school dinners. <laughs> 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 nah, but, um, nah, but like, the, the, I think that was a natural filtration mm. process that, those who really wanted it did it. Do you know what I mean? True, true, true. Um, do you think that will come? Do you think that still uh, does that filtering system still apply to people in the in a porter scene? Because, like you say, that the the margin of the price is down. You know what? I think I think it's great um, for whatever level of dedication you want to put into it. Mm. Because I'm sure there's a ton of people out there who had mates when they went to uni who DJ yeah, yeah, who yeah. never did it because yeah. it was so expensive or whatever but always fancied having a bit of a go so there'll be people out there whose first turntable who are my age whose first turntable yeah. is a portable turntable yeah, 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 yeah. so all of a sudden oh yeah I fancy having a go at that mm-hmm. do you know what I mean mm-hmm. and and they can just have fun with it mm-hmm. or or for the for you know for the uh, more serious guys you know all of a sudden you can actually jam on a street corner like the rappers always could yeah, or you know totally. or, or you can meet up in a park with dudes and jam mm. or you know like it just keeps it fun or you know uh, or, or you can have like a turntable in a room you wouldn't have before or, so it's, like whatever, acoustic, it's like acoustic isn't it it's like acoustic guitar it's, it's wicked it's, and it's fun and like for once um, the community is actually dictating where the scene goes techni- mm. technologically what speaking because you've got like like these dudes like Jesse Dean and there's there's a bunch of different different people who are making the mods who are making the turntables into like a more solid pro- product for the turntablist and getting them closer to being like you know like you've got all sorts of platters you can put on them to get more stable and x y and z and um it's cool because you know people with a bit of knowledge in this arena you know whether it's like an engineering thing yeah. or you know they've got a 3D printer or whatever, you know, we're we're making the mods that we want to see, you know. That's so it reminds me of a skater scene actually. It does. The so mod- DIY, it's yeah. it's punk and, and we're flipping the roles because I think for too long the DJ companies have, have had too much influence on what we do as DJs, mm. you know. Okay, we've got to get a new product out this year. So we've got to have ten new features. And then all of a sudden you've got like thousands of DJs sort of basing what they do creatively for the next 10 months on on the new kit that just came out mm. rather than the other way around where you know um don't get me wrong there are still dj companies that listen to djs yeah but um yeah it should it should always be the djs that dictate where this goes creatively and te- yeah. technologically i think which has always been the order of the day ever since turntablism came since the cuba era of you know the battle tools and whatnot you know the the Ownership of 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 tech of tech in a creative sense is super important, particularly in the DJ world, isn't it? Yeah, man. Like, and 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 don't forget the technics 
this whole turntablism thing shouldn't even be a thing. Do you know mm. what I mean? Like the Technics was made for playing records on radio mm. or whatever in a club. And, you know, and Theodore and Flash and all, mm -hmm. all they took this thing and did something new with it and did something that shouldn't be done. Mm. And I think that's always been the magic. That's why, you know, watching whatever, Kid Koala do like a solo on a tennis. Hold tight, Kid Koala, there's a name that ain't been out there. Come on, yeah, hold tight. Yeah, like, yeah, big influence on me, like, mm. through his musicality as well. Mm. And um, that's the magic. That's that's why, you know, if you're into this thing, that's that's why it can seem even more impressive to see a person use a turntable truly as a musical instrument and flex it and flip something. Mm. That's why it can like give you that feeling even more so than necessarily than watching a good piano player play the piano mm. because that shouldn't be done. Like that is a turntable. What's he doing with yeah. it? Even now it's the case. Or well, what is that it? thing he's using? That's still that's that's baffling as well, you know. Mix master mic, you, mm. you know, like mm. all these all these dudes, you're just like it's it it feels magical when you see see that, mm. you know what I mean? Um and that's, that applies to you as well. If you guys haven't checked out Woody, <laughs> then you know where to go. The, the social's on, on, on fire right now. And Woodwork as well. Yeah, woodworkrecords.com. That's, yeah. that's the label. And I'm just trying to make products that, that I would want. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, so, so, yeah, there's the portable stuff, like uh, trying to make fun, put cool samples on sevens, you know. I'm, I'm a graphic designer as well. I love artwork. Mm -hmm. um, so I either design it all myself or there's a couple of people. Um, my mate Gary, uh, Dusty Pixels, has done some uh, well tight. garbage pail type uh, yeah, sort yeah, of love vibes. It. And, um, <laughs> and Foz from Heroin Skateboards, yeah. old, like old Burnley skater, uh, mm. who's like one of the biggest artists in the skate scene, mm. basically. I love his style. It's sort of punk, sort of scratchy, um, zine style. And you're of. saying you master in London, don't you? Um, yeah, Air, Air Studios, yeah. man. Like, yeah, we've got... Proper high-spec shit, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the dude who cuts all the records has done, like, Beatles records, Prince records, mm. Madonna, like, all, all the things, and he's making my scratch records. That's so, so sick. Yeah. So, but just trying to... I do, Trying to do everything myself, so yeah. put it all together and just trying to make nice, nice products for people. That's and the fun bit, though, isn't it? When you're doing cottage industry again, it's just so much control is everything, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, being in this industry, kind of, I mean, there's a certain, some people are great at delegating. I don't know if I'm a bit of a control freak. I like to mm. have hands on everything, basically. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's it, like, um, and you've kind of got to be in this scene as well to a certain extent. To know the, to know the landscape and where you're walking. Mm. Yeah, man, and just be self-sufficient, you know, mm. and uh, do it all in-house. But, um, but yeah, just and, and on a deeper level, trying to make the scratch records that can encourage and encourage a musical sort of outlook on this on this whole project. Do you know what I mean? Like, does so sick. You know, make make records for turntable musicians mm. rather than just your, your R's and your freshers and stuff. There's, mm. there's a place for that and it's fun and it's practicing and it's jamming. Mm. But yeah, let's take, let's keep going with this in, as an instrument. Do you know what I mean? We've, we've only been doing it 40 years. Mm. It's got some legs yet. Mm. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's heights at to which there's, you know, you know, it's, it can go on and on. Um, so yeah, so recording musicians, um, creating records specifically for turntablists to be more musical. Mm. Yeah. Basically making things that I want as a punter. Which is everything. That's the most important important ingredient. And it takes it takes people like myself, like you, like other people that have walked that life and know what A is missing, B, what people would like if it was there. Some people don't even know what they want yet until they until it's presented to them. So Hats off to you, man, and the woodwork stuff, you know? I try and, dude. <laughs> the future's bright, my brother. Hope so, hope so, man, as long as we, uh, yeah, can keep happy and keep creative and stuff and yeah. keep keep pushing it as much as we can. Yeah. Thank you for having me in the spot, man. I yeah, mean, it's man. a sunny day out there. Beach time. The family, the family <laughs> are waiting, you know what I mean? We've kept this one going, but thank you so much for having me, brother. Oh, thank dude. you so much. 
Thank you for coming on the podcast, man. Thank you for coming to Mikasa, dude. Yeah, man. <laughs> I tell you what, it's been a long time coming, man. We've actually been planning to do this for a while. Yeah, we've we'll but... been chatting for a bit. <laughs> but, yeah, man. But we made it work. We made yeah, it work. Definitely, definitely. My guy, ladies and gentlemen, DJ Woody, what more can we add? Yeah, then a flight visit over here. When you're in town, you know what I mean? Come to the Mecca, come to the turntable Mecca up north. Big shout out, Woody. Hold tight, everybody. Don't forget, sharing is caring. Share it all the way, all right? Don't talk to anyone I wouldn't. Stay lucky, people. Peace.